Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Perilous Pursuit Kingdom Hearts by Disney and the OP Games, or USAopoly. It is a two to five player cooperative die rolling game in an epic pursuit to defeat the Heartless or have one of your characters hit that dreaded zero HP. And of course, another way you can fail to win is if you lose two worlds. The way you win the game is defeat all six worlds that you have to deal with in the game. And how you're gonna do that is by taking the die and rolling them, similar to games like Yahtzee. You'll roll the dice, re-roll as many die as you'd like, re-roll again, place them down, and create uh, readies, sets, and then activate them. You can activate your own stuff or your opponent's or your ally's stuff, and it's unique abilities that everybody's going to get. Things like protecting the die away from the bad guys, or attacking the bad guys, reducing their track, as well as things like shielding yourself or healing yourself, and some other unique little twists and turns, like drawing cards. Your objective, of course, is to break each world. You're trying to free the world, move on to the next one, and free the next one. But if you fail to free a world, nasty stuff happens. And every time you progress in the game, yes, you progress, but also there's a chance you're going to lose some value that you gained. Will you be able to save yourself and your allies or comrades in the game Kingdom Hearts Perilous Pursuit? Or will you fall into the darkness and be defeated by the Heartless? To begin a game of Perilous Pursuit, go ahead and have each player choose one of the characters available. In the Kingdom Hearts version, there are five different characters, Riku, Kairi, Goofy, Sora, and of course, Donald Duck. Additionally, give each player five shield tokens, every single one of their ready tokens, every single one of their set tokens, and give them a health marker or health tracker and place that on the number 10. Then give every single player one of the action cards from the action deck. After that, you're going to then set up the Heartless World deck. Uh, there are six different ones you'll start the game with. One one, two twos, and three threes, totaling a total of six. Place the one on top of the twos and those on top of the threes, and that has created your world deck of worlds that you'll need to save in, um, in order from one to two to two to three to three to three. And if you can do that, you win. Then go ahead and set the uh, Heartless tracker and place that based on the number of players. If you're playing a four or five player game, place it on the green triangle, and if you're playing a two or three player game, place it on the blue circle. After that, give one player the set of dice. They're going to have five blue dice and a singular black die that they'll use on their turn. Set aside the rest of the worlds, you may use them throughout the game, the rule book, and of course the box, and then begin by having that first player roll all the dice. That's how the setup works, pretty simple. Playing the game Perilous Pursuits Kingdom Hearts is also rather simple. All you're going to do is after rolling that first set of six dice, you're going to choose the dice you'd like to keep, then re-roll the rest. And you can do three rolls total. After you've rolled the dice three times, you're basically locked into what you have, and you can now place them. You're able to place in two different areas, either on your opponent's boards or on your own board. But the only time you can place on your opponent's board is if they have a set marker down. If they have a set marker, you can activate that set marker with a similar die of the same type of uh, symbol. And you can use that ability after all your dice have been chosen or selected into a certain area. On your board, however, you can not only go ahead and place your markers on your set areas, but you're also going to create your board. And the way you do that is you're going to uh, basically roll the dice and you're going to place those symbols on your board in first the ready locations and then the set locations and then finally you can go ahead and place a die on top of that set location to activate that area. What's going to happen is after your turn is over, you're going to place all of your ready tokens as long as you completed all of the required symbols. So in order for a Donald Duck to get the collect uh, space for ready, they're going to need one potion. So one potion on one of the die and to set that die there. In order to get the set for the potion, well, you're going to have to get uh, one more die of that same type. And then to utilize it, it will cost an additional die. So then you'll have a ready, a set, and you can use it. However, of course, it gets more challenging as the uh, requirements get more and more difficult. For instance, if you would like something like the ability to distract with Donald, you're going to need four of these triangles to start off with a ready, one of them for the set, and then finally an additional one in order to activate. 
the benefit though, however, is once you have built onto your tableau the readies and the sets, they don't ever get removed unless a card or an ability says otherwise. So you get to keep them and continuously use them. And of course, your opponents can use them, or your allies, I should say, can use them on their turn. As long as you have a set a token on any of these abilities, they can place one of their die on all or um, on any of the chosen ones they would like, and they can use that ability. And it's going to continue like that. Uh, the first the player will roll his dice, roll, 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 place, 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 choose, place any readies, then place any sets, place any activates on either his or an ally's board, and then after that their turn is over. Followed by the Heartless taking their turn. And the way the Heartless takes turns is pretty simple as well. The Heartless is going to have a number of die on the top right hand side of their board, indicating the number of blue die they will roll and the black die if it is going to be rolled or not. And in this case, we're looking at the Traverse Town. Um, this one's going to have one black die that needs to be rolled and three blue die. So they'll take the die and then they're going to roll them. Maybe the player that just previously rolled will do that. And then based on what the board says is what happens. So in this case here, if you roll a key, it's going to push the track up by one, meaning that if you're playing a two or three player game, the pushing the track up by one heartless will move it closer to the world being lost. Uh, if you push it by two, it'll go two. And if it ever hits to the world lost section, the world is ended and you will lose the specific world. Um, another one is going to be no effect, especially with the easier ones, a lot of them are going to be no effect. And then another one would be something like losing health. All of your characters have HP and the previous character to roll is the person who would lose the HP based on the world, because it's gonna go player, world, player, world, back and forth. And so every time a player finishes their turn is a possibility that the world after them uh, that, that takes their turn is going to do damage to them. And you never wanna hit zero because if you do, everyone on your team loses. And then of course, something even extra nasty happens if you roll a heartless, right? The heartless is going to affect not only uh, negatively when the world rolls, but also when players roll dice uh, specifically for their, their Yahtzee mechanic. After the dice have been rolled just once for the Heartless and everything has been activated, then it goes to the next player's turn and it just continues from there. And that's, that's the entire game. Defeat six worlds and you win by basically freeing them. Or if you lose two worlds or somebody hits zero, you lose. Let's talk about a couple caveats now. The first thing is this black die. If on your turn when you're rolling in order to gather your sets and your readies as well as activates, if you roll a Heartless on your turn, Every die that was rolled with the black die that rolled the heartless is going to have to be re-rolled and uh, it basically kind of removes the chances of you keeping those die. So if at the very beginning of your turn you roll all the dice and you hit a heartless, sadly you are going to have to, you're going to have to not be able to use those and re-roll. So you will have lost a full roll. However, if you roll only three dice, you will have to re-roll just those guys there. Uh, whenever a Heartless is rolled uh, on the world boards, that is going to inflict an extra more negative effect on most likely all players. So Heartless are kind of deadly. Now, additionally, uh, we're gonna talk about how the worlds work. If you beat a world, you're going to set the world aside, saying, okay, we, got it, we beat this, you're gonna set it aside, and then each player is going to take the black die, and that player is going to roll that die in turn order. I roll, you roll, Jen rolls, so on and so forth. And then whatever symbol you roll, you will have to lose your ready and set markers from that location. If the location doesn't have a ready or set marker, no big deal. However, if it does, you lose them both. If you roll a heartless, you're going to lose all of your sets, which are your small markers, and then you're gonna to have to roll again. And whatever we ready you roll, you'll have to lose that as well. So a heartless is even deadly, even when you successfully accomplish or beat a world. And that's, I'll explain why that's four in the review. And then everybody's going to do that. However, and then you move on to the next world and you'll just rinse and repeat. Your next player will take their turn and the world is going to take their turn and you'll place the marker based on the number of players on the track in order to try and defeat or defeat the world or lose the world. And another thing to note too is if you lose the world. Losing a world is extremely deadly. What happens is the world will be considered lost. That's halfway to losing the game. It gets removed. You'll add a new random world from the stack and put it on the bottom of your stack of worlds. And then uh, players are going to basically be rolling, uh, the, they'll be rolling these die here, two additional die. And I believe they also lose all of their set markers. So 
it can be really, really, really nasty. And what happens too is if you roll a heartless when you roll the two die as opposed to one for winning, you will lose the top three highest uh, ready markers on your board. So in this case here, if I was Donald and I had these three, I would lose all three of these when rolling a heartless. And if I roll the key as well, uh, basically what happened is I would lose the key again. But so far I lost, no big deal. But if I rolled something like the wild symbol, I would lose these and all three of these to include for the heartless. A benefit though is you could get super lucky and roll a heartless and a wild on the blue die, which means you won't lose anything uh, when you lose a world if these are the two ones that you rolled other than just your set markers. Uh, that being said, uh, you'll move on just like you normally would by winning a world by placing the marker down on the world track. The next player will get a chance to go and you'll continue playing the game. And that's it. Just think of the game very simply in steps. Uh, rolling the dice three times, placing them where you want, activating abilities, attempting to push the world tracker in your favor by attacking, attempting to stop the world from rolling additional die with your distract markers, because when you distract the world, it prevents them from using that die. So in this case, if it required five die and you distracted one of them, then they're only going to use three die, three blue and a black, or you could even distract the black die and just use four blue. And everybody has a distract, which means you can kind of reduce the world simply by blocking off all their dice. Um, and of course, it costs a die to block a die. And other abilities will include healing your allies, shielding your allies, utilizing your shield tokens you start the game with, and placing them in these little markers here. So whenever you take a damage, you'll remove it from your shield as opposed to your actual HP. And then lastly, to talk about is cards. When you start the game, you'll have a card to utilize. And you can give it to yourself or to somebody else as an ally. You can kind of make them utilize your card instead of yourself. Uh, and you can also gain them from the little potions. So if you place a potion on a set potion ability, whether it's yours or your opponent's, you can draw a card at the end of your turn, which will then be able to be utilized on your opponent's turns or on your next turn. And they provide additional symbols that you can use uh, as well as when you roll dice. So maybe you need an extra two wild to get that ready on your wild. You can use this little card here. Sometimes it will prevent the heartless from rolling a heartless symbol. Other times you can re-roll your die or when the bad guys roll and so on and so forth. They're all pretty straightforward and explanatory on the cards and they're kind of just a better way of solidifying your next turn at a cost you on this turn. Okay, that's basically the game uh, Perilous Pursuit, Kingdom Hearts. I think I pretty much explained it as fully as humanly possible. Let's go ahead and discuss my review now. Perilous Pursuit Kingdom Hearts is an epic cooperative die roller set in the fantasy world of Kingdom Hearts. As a child, I played the heck out of the first game, and I even played the second game, but I didn't play the third because I heard it wasn't as good and it didn't have the Final Fantasy characters. And, and, and nevertheless, I really enjoyed Kingdom Hearts. Uh, this has all of my favorite characters in Kingdom Hearts. I mean, I would have preferred Mickey as opposed to Goofy, but uh, you don't technically play as Mickey in the game, so I guess it's okay. I would have also preferred a Final fantasy character in here but i don't know if square enix could have added nevertheless small gripes i'm not really going to get into that but what characters are here are great you're going to have sora you're going to have riku uh kairi goofy and donald duck donald is my favorite and you'll be able to utilize those they work cooperatively together and they, each of their boards are different and they each have their own unique special ability which is nice as well and even their basic abilities are kind of changed up so it's not like everybody's same uh, top ability is attack no riku is the attacker and sora is but Donald is good at collecting here uh, Kyrie can distract and Goofy is able to uh, protect I meaning give shields which makes sense because Goofy basically walked on the shield in the game this is similar to a King of Tokyo style game or the uh, Sword Art Online Dice Roller. There's also a Dragon Ball Z one from IDW that plays kind of similar. And I've seen this game type before. Rolling dice, placing them down, and then being able to defeat the enemy in some way and benefit yourself. Elements is another game, right? Uh, what makes this game different is A, the player boards are high quality and of course involve the IP of Kingdom Hearts and the the way in which you utilize your powers is different as well. The fact that you're going to be rolling dice and can kind of decide what types of powers you want to try and gain, and uh, always having at least one or two types of abilities, and progressively empowering your character throughout the game is very unique as well. 
basically what can happen is you can try and go for your big ability to begin with in the game and easily start conquering if you are able to do that, but it's going to require a lot of luck or a lot of cards to push your way through. Or you can start building up the easier abilities and move on from there and working with other players. Based on the number of players, that changes the game because you might not have a Kyrie in order to distract. And when you're on the last world, it'll be more difficult for you because the distract action is not going to be as likely to be available. It's much more harder to distract with Donald than it is with Kyrie or somebody like Riku. So you kind of have to choose your uh, characters and opponents, uh, your characters, your allies, uh, collectively in the way you want to play the game, your specific style. Head, bush, head bashing or do you want to kind of uh, progressively empower your characters to the point where they're all stoked up and then go for it really depends and there's a distracting style of play as well. Uh, yes the die rolling game does include luck, you're going to be rolling, you might not get what you want but mitigation is key and that's based in the cards here, that's based in uh, the re-rolling of the die and of course there is a little bit of a negative which is this black die. It can actually give you instead of a wild because there are wild ones, there are these little crowns here, you can get a heartless and that can be pretty damaging but it's not too painful. It's more of like a dang it, that's not what I wanted at all. There are cards to mitigate that though as well, even just preventing that heartless from not allowing you to re-roll those or having to re-roll those die as opposed to keeping the ones that you want to keep. Additionally, there's a lot of worlds, a ton of them in fact. There are front and back levels one, two, and three, and they get progressively more difficult. And it gets um, to the point where the, the roles that you get are almost always gonna be guaranteed to be bad. It just really depends on the world and what the world is trying to do to you. And your play style will be based on that world. If the world is all about doing damage, you're going to want to shield more. If the world is all about pushing the heartless to make the world end, or be destroyed, you need to attack that world and push that up more than it brings it down each turn while still progressively always keeping that secondary goal of keeping your character uh, stockpiled. Every time you beat a world, speaking of which, you're going to have to roll a die and potentially lose those abilities, those hard-earned abilities that you've gained, which is always going to be intense because if you have your specific unique ability, you never want to roll that because if you do, you will lose it. And every time you roll a Yahtzee and Yahtzee, it's very exciting, it's very awesome. And in this game, it's even more so because you can keep that Yahtzee forever unless you get bad luck. And then you're going to lose that ability, which is so powerful because they transfer from world to world as long as you don't lose them. And just like, for instance, Donald, when you use the uh, attack and heal one ability, which is his ult, you can use it each and every turn. Everybody can utilize that. But <laughs> losing it is going to make you have to reroll all those symbols all over again. And each character has their own little function, whether it be double attack or whether it be something like draw a card and attack, a shield and attack. And every single one of the abilities that you want to use only costs one die whether it's on your side of the board or on your opponent's side of the board. And so the ultimates are always better because they give you more value for your singular die. So it just always makes sense. You have to want to keep certain abilities. Usually for me, it's distract and my ult. And uh, of course, the game is going to progressively play based on the world, whether you want to do something different or not. And the playstyle you choose to incorporate will have to change as well. Now, the game's intense. Uh, when I were playing it, I believe two nights ago, on our live stream, it was constant like, oh, I hope this doesn't happen. Or, I hope this does happen. And I, I just thought that was really, really entertaining. It was really, really fun to watch my friends kind of want us to do certain things. We're working together. It's, it's very much so not a... This is the one way to best do it, especially at the start of the game, but it can kind of turn into that at the end. So, okay, let's go over pros and cons. Uh, pro number one, now the, the IP and the quality of the game are great. The IP is, uh, for those people who have played it, or it's gonna be a definite must if you really enjoyed those games. And the pieces on the board, the thickness and, and uh, the ability to place the pieces into it feels good. The dice are all etched and have unique symbols, which is very nice, and of course the sheet. The only things that are probably not super great are maybe if you don't like the little cards, you would have preferred bigger ones. And the fact that the uh, world bosses or worlds are just thin paper-like. But because you get so many, I give them a pass. Otherwise, though, even the box is great. Another pro to the game is the cooperative nature of it. No one is ever mad at anybody specifically. You're going to have fun all the way around, even when you lose. And it can be super challenging at times. And sometimes it can be super easy. And in both cases, it can be a lot of fun. Because in a game that plays like this, those type of Yahtzee cooperative games, it can be fun to lose and it is fun to win as well. 
And uh, I guess the last thing that I would say that's really positive about the game is that the characters feel different, the play styles you can choose feel different, and the number of players you're playing with will change the way in which you'd probably want to play the game. All right, some negatives. Negative number one is this game is a chance game. You might not roll what you want, and while you might not be frustrated with the players playing with you, you might be frustrated with the game itself and what it gives you. It also is possible when rolling dice against the worlds, you might get the worst roll possible and it might sink your ship almost instantly. There's moments in time where you'll hope it doesn't do a thing and it might do that thing, and after you work so hard, you'll, you'll lose your best laid plans, you will lose the value that you have gained. It's possible that that can happen as well. And uh, another thing to this game too, is when looking at these cards here, these super small cards, it's even hard to tell when I first even picked up the game what side was front and back. And sometimes you won't really know, I mean, you'll know the game on the cards and what they do after you've played a bit, but just drawing a card and seeing a crown doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Uh, or something like re roll three less blue for the world. That doesn't mean a whole lot unless you know fully how the, the game works. So it's not super intuitive with the cards, and I just think it could have been better colorized so that you could see the symbols better on the back sides. They would have been a little nicer for players to be able to tell the difference between those cards a little bit more. And I think that's pretty much it. The, the luck aspect was probably the main thing, and of course, the chance. I, I guess the last little negative I will say is when playing the game, it's going to be probably more challenging at the very beginning or midway through if you fail than it will be at the end. It's more likely that you're gonna have a ton of your abilities kind of set up and it's more likely that it's going to be easier to do that damage you need to do in a couple turns on the very last world where it might take more turns in the very beginning because of the setup aspect. And there are certain ways in which I won't tell you how, I think you can learn and figure out the different strategies to determine how to kind of build your board up before pushing on and how soon you should push on and when you should be ready to transfer from world to world, that all plays a difference. And then if you wanna make the game more challenging, you can add the twos and threes or even take away the one at the very beginning and add a two instead. So there is difficulty increases and decreases to play your own kind of flexibility. That's it, that's all I got for you. Okay, so what do I think overall about this game? It's great, I had a lot of fun. If you like cooperative games, you'll enjoy it. If you like die rolls, you'll enjoy it. If you've played something like King, uh, like a King of Tokyo and you want something cooperative, this is another fun one with a great IP. That's, that's it, all right? Pick it up if you want. Link down in the description, I would give this my a seal of approval. We had a ton of fun. I, I, I thought it was great, but my friends thought it was extra great, so it's gonna get my seal of approval, right? Right there, okay, outro. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Perilous Pursuit Kingdom Hearts. If you're interested in picking up the game, I guess that there's a link down below in the description, affiliation link on Amazon, so it can pay me 5%, woo! <laughs> um, Oh, a disclaimer, the game was given to me by the OP. Thank you, the OP, for giving me this game. I typically don't do disclaimers because all of the games are given to me. I don't do reviews like otherwise, but people want a disclaimer, so there you go. All right, also, unfilteredgame.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more there. You can win random games. You can see us play live streams at 6.30 p.m. PST. We play games just like this one, and in fact, we did play this game last week, and it is on YouTube, so you can watch us play through it to determine for yourself if it's a game for you, uh, ignoring my opinion completely, which would be just fine. <laughs> you can also go ahead and join us on Patreon if you want. One buck a month goes a long way. It helps us push through. Um, adding stuff like Streamlabs, we pay for weekly and monthly things like our website, and all that kind of stuff. So that all goes uh, towards that. Even even shipping giveaways, etc., etc. Moonshell is being shipped out this week. So if you just bought the base game, I'm assuming you might get it um, sometime in time for Christmas. Maybe a little before, maybe a little after. No promises. I'm just it's it's not it's out of my hands now unless uh, you bought it on the site. Moonshell is available on our website, and my wife is shipping those out personally now that we know the games are going out, but just the base game, not the deluxe. Everybody's getting all the games at the same time, trying to make that fair and as balanced as we possibly could. And deluxe ones will come out in the next couple weeks. We're just waiting on the finishing product to make sure it's perfect for you guys. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I look forward to defeating the Heartless with you next time. <laughs>